chapter number 6, and starting in verse number 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the, Ara the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and, Ge and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease, while I leave it, and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sword, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Sambalad his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, uh, and Geshemua saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou faintest them out of thine own heart. Now listen, this, this verse 9 is what was a blessing to me. I, a lot of those verses are very familiar past the scripture, but verse number 9 just, just kind of blessed me, those last few verses, words there. It says, For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now, therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I, uh, I need strength today. We all need a strengthening from you today. And Father, I, I can't deliver a message um, to these dear people without your power uh, upon me today. And so I beg you, Holy Spirit of God, please enable me that I would deliver a message that, that would not be another sermon uh, but would be an opportunity for your people to see the Savior. And Father, I pray uh, as we consider so many truths here in the book of Nehemiah that you'd allow every one of them to resonate with us very personally, very precisely, and help each of us to have our spiritual needs met uh, in this time. And I, I, I'm thankful that the Bible says it is still by the foolishness of preaching uh, that men and women are saved. And so, Lord, if there's somebody here or even under the sound of the preaching over the Internet, they have yet to trust Jesus as their Savior. I pray that today be the day where they put their faith and their trust in Him. And Father, we just be very careful to give you all the praise, all the thanksgiving, uh, all the exaltation ahead of time, even before we start preaching, just having a confidence and a trust that your word won't go out and come back void. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. What a wonderful, wonderful book in the Old Testament. Uh, I hope, that at the very least, I hope that uh, you'd be encouraged to go back and, and look at this book and just find some of your own blessings here. Uh, but what a wonderful book in the, in the Old Testament that has a lot of New Testament application, which, by the way, a lot of the Old Testament, all of the Old Testament, even though it's in a different dispensation, uh, is still applicable for each of us. Amen. We understand it's got a little bit of, we, we, have, to, we have to discern it and uh, we have to understand the counsel of God's word, but it's got application for us all throughout scripture. Amen. You can even find application in the lists of names. Don't skip over the list of names. Amen. Uh, even in the list of names, you find that God knows their name. Amen. And uh, that there is a, that, that God detailed those individuals on purpose. There is a purpose for every word, every jot, every tittle in scripture. Amen. God's word has something to and I love the book of Nehemiah. For those who are not familiar with this book, uh, or, or it's been a while since you've, been, since you've considered Nehemiah, uh, it is really a continuation of the book of Ezra. Some even call it the second book of Ezra um, as, a, as, a, as a nickname for it. Um, but uh, you, you see, uh, when, when you study the history of the Jewish people, you'll find that God gave them very clear instruction. Amen. He gave them a very clear law a very clear expectation. He gave them a very clear order, really a foolproof plan 
if they would simply obey him. Even in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the, the Moses says, look, before you today is a, a curse and a blessing. Amen. The blessing, if you follow the Lord, follow the word of God, you just simply obey. Uh, there's a lot of good for you. Amen. But then there's a curse if you step outside of the boundaries of God's word. He gave very clear instruction. Praise God, he gave very clear enabling all through the Old Testament. All uh, and we see in God's um, dealings with his people in the Old Testament, we find enabling after enabling. We find blessing after from the manna, uh, from the fowls that came as a result of complaining. They didn't deserve those. God still was gracious. He took care of them. The water uh, out of the rock, God enabled them. God, God gave them uh, a, a direction and guidance by, uh, by day and guidance by night and and, and, and uh, protected them from their enemies. I mean, message after message could be derived from just the, the, the thought of God given strength in battle. We certainly have a lot of battle in our days, battle with sin, battle with our flesh, and, and battle with this world. And God gave his people enabling uh, in, that old, in, in that old times. Uh, we saw the Jews rebel, though. Uh, a constant theme of the of the Jewish people uh, of God's people, the Hebrews of that day. The constant theme, uh, one of the things that sum them up probably the best in in a lot of ways, is their constant, their regular rebellion. Simple stuff, simple stuff too, uh, like the Sabbath day. And God say you keep that day holy. Uh, or, or stuff like they give the, the, a, a year for uh, a time of rest for, their, for the certain crops or for certain fields and just simple stuff. Uh, of course, uh, among idolatry and immorality, uh, following after, chasing, chasing after gods of, uh, of other people, lowercase G-O-D, of course. Uh, and, and, and so we see their rebellion. And before you get too hard on the Jewish people, this, ain't, this is not an anti-Semitic uh, message. Uh, before you get too hard on the Jewish people, uh, take inventory on your own personal rebellion against God. Amen. Because we all are, we are all susceptible to that. Uh, we, none of us are above rebellion. And uh, we probably all rebel a lot more, rebel to the word of God a lot more than we'd like or we care to admit uh, publicly amongst our church family today. So let's not get our noses too high in the air or become too pious here. Amen. Remind, remember, we're all, we all have a a temptation for rebellion uh, in us. But we see the rebellion. We also see God's gracious warnings. Uh, God graciously warned his people time and time again, don't stop. Stop going there. Stop doing that. Repent. Get right. And, 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 and I'll restore. Get right. And, and you'll see the blessings back on your households and back on your nation. Uh, get right. There's your warnings. They're there. He sent men after men after men uh, delivering warnings to God's people about their error. We see God's correction, though. We see God's judgment. We see his chastisement. God gave Israel over to their enemies, and they were taken captive. We see that uh, just as God promised, if they continued in a rebellion, would happen, that exactly happened. Oh, but we see God's mercy. He, he foretold that he would save a remnant. Uh, and now, towards the end of God's correcting captivity... God has moved the hearts of the leadership of that day to allow his people to start making their way back to Jerusalem. Zerubbabel and Ezra, I won't say that name too many times, amen, they had been given permission to go back and rebuild the temple. And we see a lot of that in the book of Ezra, and what, a, what another, another blessed book, really. Uh, just a, a wonderful opportunity. You know, I know that we're talking about the walls today. We're talking about the great work of Nehemiah, but uh, we could park just a minute. We could park for a long time if we wanted to on that rebuilding of the temple. There's some things spiritually that need to be rebuilt in our day. Hey, man, we, 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 we need to have our altars rebuilt, a, 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 a refining to our altars, just a re-commitment re, re, uh, 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 to the old-fashioned altars uh, of, of yesteryear, amen, uh, uh, getting back to a place where we live by the Word of God, amen, we find the Word of God and we live by the Word of God. It, it, it just, there's, there's a lot we could talk about in the rebuilding of the temple there with Ezra and Zerubbabel. In the midst of their rebuilding, Nehemiah hears of those that have made it back to Jerusalem, and he hears that, they're in, that those are in Jerusalem and those that are in the process and towards the end of the rebuilding of the temple, he hears that they're in great affliction and reproach. He heard that the walls were broken down along with the gates, the Bible says, were burned with fire. This breaks, this is back in Nehemiah chapter number one, and this breaks Nehemiah's heart. I mean, he is just overwhelmed with grief, overwhelmed with, with burden, uh, and to the point that, it, that his, his broken heart is seen in his countenance. 
Artaxerxes, the king of that day, sees the change of behavior, the change of continence in, the, in, in Nehemiah, and he asks him about it. And Nehemiah, yes, he, he, he takes that opportunity and, and uh, not flippantly, but reverently, asks permission to go and see for himself and is given permission, and not only given permission, but, permi- but provision for him to be able to get there. Nehemiah realizes the importance of the walls, amen. He gets down there and realizes the importance of the walls, sees the, how, how broken down they are, sees the state they're in, and he stirs up his brethren in Jerusalem to get busy rebuilding the walls and the rest of Jerusalem. Now, this ain't the primary message, but i can I got to say to you today, walls are still important, amen? And this ain't a political message either. I'm not even talking about the border wall. I'm talking about our own, I'm talking about the walls in our churches, Amen. I'm talking about the walls in your own personal life. Amen. I'm talking about the walls in your home today. Amen. I'm not talking about the physical ones. I'm talking about those metaphoric walls. I'm talking about barriers and, and, and putting those boundaries in your life. Listen, you, you don't just do whatever you want to do. Amen. We got to be careful in this day to not fall victim uh, to or pray uh, to the world's way of thinking. We are to be different. Walls protect us. Boundaries protect us. Some hate that word, but that word standards, they are protecting. They don't, they don't impress God. God don't look down and go, wow, look at their standards. Amen. That's, that, aren't you glad that he don't? Aren't you glad that when he looks down, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your account? Hey, man, I'm glad that he's not, he's not looking at my standards uh, as, a, as a way of uh, acceptance with him, amen? And that's all settled at the cross of Calvary. Uh, but I want to protect my family from getting into the wickedness and the sin of this world. And so we put some boundaries in our household, and, and we won't get into all the details there. We don't have time for that today. But walls, they keep, they keep the wicked out. They protect. They keep the world out. Amen? Walls allow us to be selective on what gets in. Amen? We, we can open the door and shut the door. Listen, we don't, we don't need more bridges built in our day. We need more walls repaired and rebuilt. I'm not talking about this, and I'm not saying it's wrong to get along. I'm not saying it's wrong to be nice or to be kind, to be polite to people, and to, and to find areas that we can fellowship if, if they are there. Uh, but we don't need to be putting up bridge uh, over doctrinal errors and doctrinal differences. Amen? There's only one God. Amen? He's the God Jehovah. All right, his, 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 he's not the moon God, right? We have one God. That's it. He's one living God. We have one mediator, one way to God, and that's our Savior, Jesus Christ. It, it is by faith, amen, it is his grace that's accessed by faith, amen. There's nothing that we do to get it. There's nothing we do to attain it, amen. It's all done. It's all cared for uh, in that word everlasting life. We don't need to build walls up to people to believe differently than that. We need to reach them, love on them, pray for them. I'll move on. Sam Ballot, Tobiah, Geshem, uh, and the enemies of God's people, the Bible says there, they didn't like the progress. Hey, man, they didn't like things. They didn't like to see that things were being accomplished back there in that ghost, ghost town of Jerusalem. Once destroyed, once wrecked, once chastised by a heavy hand of judgment of God that allowed the enemies to come in there and, and, and to, and to uh, take over and to take captive God's people. Oh, but now God is mercifully allowing a return to his promised place for his promised people. And they didn't like it. The enemies, they opposed the work. They didn't like the progress. And by the way, that is just like our adversary today. We begin, can I tell you, church, you, you need to be ready. The Bible says be sober, be vigilant. As we grow and as we start to gain momentum uh, in spiritual things and we start seeing, seeing God work through us and use us as a local assembly to reach our community, you better believe the enemy will, not, will, will see that and not like it. And that's not to scare you off because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Hey, listen, I, I'll tell you because I want you to be sober, be vigilant. Amen. But I want you also to understand that God has our back. Amen. I'm not going to be scared about that. I want, I'm going to be aware. I'm going to watch. I'm going to keep the doors closed so the enemy can't get in. Right? I'm not going to do anything to, 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 to be negligent and allow him to mess something up. But at the same time, I'm not going to conduct uh, our, my service to the Lord in fear. Amen. Because God 
God uh, has our back. The devil doesn't like it when he sees churches rebuilding, repairing, and fortifying. He doesn't like to see the progress of the world, the, the work of God. So Nehemiah and his crew, they're, they're forced to work and watch. Amen? They're ready to swing a hammer and or a sword, maybe both at the same time. As way of introduction, in chapter number 6, we see that these enemies of God, uh, enemy of God and enemy of his work after mockery and after other tactics to stop their efforts, they had failed. And seeing that those protecting boundaries, those protecting walls were almost complete, they sent unto Nehemiah trying to get him to come away from Jerusalem to the plain of Ono. Of course, Nehemiah perceived this to be, discerned this to be a trick, and his reply offers some of the most challenging words that I've ever read in Scripture. Verse number 3, I sent, I, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? And he's doing a great work. Amen. God had been merciful. God had allowed that remnant to come back to his, to his, to his uh, promised place for his promised people. He realized the need of the walls and, and he was engaged. He was in the midst of a rebuilding of these very important protecting boundaries. And the enemies of God were trying to entice him away, but he stood up and he said, why should I come down? It's a great work. It's been thousands of years since this event in Jewish history and yet we are still active in a great work. Yeah. Amen. You and I at Green Meadow Bible Baptist Church have been given a great work. Do you realize that? I mean, we've been given a great work. Right? We may not be rebuilding Jerusalem, but we are certainly engaged in building a kingdom. Amen. The walls that have been torn down uh, and are burning uh, may, may only be metaphorical, but they are vitally important for our safety. And, and there's some times where we must rebuild in this great work. The work that we've engaged in is a great work. There's no time for compromise. There's no time for complacency. Now listen, I'm okay with compromising on the drapes or the carpet uh, or the color of chairs or, uh, or all those different things like that. I understand that. Uh, but I'm, we're, we're, we cannot lay aside what is clearly outlined in the Word of God. There is no time for compromises. There is no time to come off the war. We are we, wall. We are in the midst of a great work. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, so built, we the, so built we the wall. It just kept on. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Right. Ain't that a blessing? How we could park there for a good long time. I'm just having some fun here with a few of these verses. We ain't even a message yet. And the people had a mind to work. Do you imagine? I just I try to picture the scurrying about. I, I, I picture these, they, they had developed a, a seriousness, a sincerity. Uh, uh, they, they realized the need and they got busy working this great work. In this wonderful book, there's a formula for success. Amen. And, and by God's grace, I'd like for us to consider that today. Listen, I'm sure that there's absolutely no way we can exhaust all the, component, all the components in this formula today. But I do think that, that we're able to highlight some of the very most important ones in this formula. If anything, I hope that your appetite will be wet to go back and to study uh, the chapters of this blessed book, searching maybe for some more helpful truths that will help you and your family that can be added to this message, added to this formula for success in, the, in the, the work, the great work that God has given us all to do. I'd like to preach, if God would help for just a little bit, on this lengthy thought. Uh, for those in the sound room, I apologize for the long title here uh, and uh, it's what what it will take to get the great work done what will it take what it will take to great get the great work done verse number one listen it's going to take some concern uh, or, or maybe maybe you could use the word comprehension I, I couldn't decide between the two so I figured I'd give them both to you and you could write them down in your notes amen it's going to take some concern Look at verse, uh, chapter number 1 uh, and verse number 4. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before 
the God of heaven. You see, there was some concern in the life of Nehemiah once he had realized, once he had seen the burden of his people. In Nehemiah chapter number 2 and verse number 2 says, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was sore afraid. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 18, the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Hey Amen. There's a, there's a need for a concern in our day. I think a lot of times we get so busy uh, and, and we, we get so busy and, and, and that we become numb to the need. You see, Nehemiah, he had it pretty good. Hey Amen. He was the king's cupbearer. His dwelling place was the palace of the king. And, and it seems to be by this interaction that he had with the king that he was serving a king that took pretty decent care of him or at least was somewhat concerned of his well-being. A normal a king, a wicked king, would have said, hey, you better dry it up uh, or I'm going to find me a new cupbearer. And you know what that means when I get rid of the cupbearer, right? But that's what he was concerned about his well-being. He was concerned about his, 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 what was going on in his, his, uh, uh, his mind there. And, and so he, he'd spent days with a king that seemed to take pretty decent care of him. At least, he seemed so for Nehemiah. Listen, when Nehemiah got word of the need in Jerusalem, it absolutely broke his heart. A concern, an overwhelming concern uh, took over in Nehemiah and the Bible tells us in chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, uh, that, that by way of night, Nehemiah, he even went out and surveyed all the damage once he had gotten down there. And when morning came, his eyes had affected his heart. Just like in Jeremiah, just like Jeremiah did in Lamentations chapter 5, verse 51, where he says, Mine eye affected my heart. He was concerned. Amen. He was concerned. He cared. He saw a need. That need broke his heart. That need gave him a, gave him a vision. Uh, uh, he, he, he comprehended the distress of his people. By the way, this, is, uh, th- this message is for those that are saved. The application here, I believe, is found by those that have, yet, that have already trusted Jesus Christ to be their personal Savior. If you're saved today... Amen. If you're saved today, if you're a child of God today, do you have a concern for the Kalamazoo area? Do you comprehend the needs of our communities? Listen, I'm not talking about the physical needs either. I'm all for helping physically if we have the means to do so. Uh, the, the, the bread and water that our community needs is the bread of life. And the water that once consumed will never let them thirst again. That's what our communities need. A spiritual person is what our community needs, not a physical provision. Jesus is that person. Our community needs the Savior. Hey, do you ever go out? Do you ever go out to our communities with a heart of concern, with a broken heart to survey the neighborhoods for the distress of our day? I've been driving some uh, driving truck a little bit again uh, lately. And over these last couple of weeks, I've had to drive a lot through uh, inner city Kalamazoo. And what I see breaks my heart. All over the place, the drug addicts and the homeless. All over the place. And I, I, I don't wag my head in judgment. I, I wag my head with a broken heart. They, don't ha- they didn't have to be like that. They don't have to be like that. Listen, I, some, sometimes you could look at those in that condition... And sometimes you could say, well, they're just, they're a lost cause. They're too far gone. But that's not what my Bible teaches. My Bible teaches that when Jesus got off that boat at Gadara, and that maniac who was known for cutting himself at night and screaming and hooping and hollering at the tombs at night, when, when he met him, Jesus was able to cure, fix, and take care of permanently that spiritual condition of that maniac at Gadara. So much so that not only was he, was he healed, was he cured, was he relieved of all that, all that spiritual warfare, but then God went and used him to reach that whole area. And later on in Scripture, we find Jesus comes back 
and from from a, a area that once said get out of here because you you you, you know about our swine to please come in here. We all got a whole bunch of sick and helpless that needs you. All as a result of that one man getting born again, getting saved, getting spiritual. Hey, listen, I, I understand there's a great spiritual battle in our city, in Comstock. You drive through Comstock? Right here in our area. I know some of y'all are from, from out in the country, and, 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 and that's all right. Hey, man, but we, 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 have, we have people walking down the road right in front of the parsons, right in front of the church right now. Strung out on drugs. They, it's, it's, it's just coming out. And the answer, hey man, the answer is not some more government. Hey man, the answer is not some secular answer. The answer is our community needs Jesus. Drug addicts all over. Broken heart. Kids all over. All over the place. Kids running around all over the place. Do you know how many kids we could reach in our area if, if we could see some Nehemiahs in our day that would get a broken heart for the needs out there? I understand the bus ministry is costly. I understand that getting a driver's license for the bus nowadays is, is, is nearly impossible, but only nearly I understand it's not cheap to do so, but it'd be a blessing if some of God's people get a broken heart for the kids in our area and say, I'll drive a bus. I'll go knock some doors and get some kiddos on a bus. I was listening to a, a message on a bus ministry this last week, and this old timer uh, was, was preaching. He was preaching about a guy that he, that he, he was preaching about how he had went and, and uh, did you hear that from Brother Robinson this week? Did you hear that message? And he's talking about a fellow in his church. He went out and bought uh, uh, four... Uh, 1939 four buses and he bought these buses he didn't even have a license of his own but he said he knew he wanted to reach the bus kids in his area and uh, he had gotten a burden in his heart for some of the kids in his area and he brought these buses back and after preaching about it a little bit he had this uh, middle-aged man had come up and surrender with a broken heart with a burden in his heart Listen, God told me to go out and get those kids that you're talking about preacher and he got his license and, and some 30, 40 years later still out there picking up kids on the bus ministry. Testimony was given that, uh, that uh, he, he stopped over at, at his preacher's house uh, one Saturday afternoon and said, Preacher, do you have a, hole, a post hole digger? And the preacher said, what in the world do you need a post hole digger for? He said, because this wicked, this wicked woman lets, lets her kids come every Sunday, but he's, she's going to keep them back from church. She hates me. She's mean. But she's going to keep her kids back from church to make them hang, uh, put up a clothesline. He said, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to dig that clothesline for us so our kids can be in church on Sunday. That's, a, that's, just, that's just a normal, everyday, ordinary child of God fulfilling his reasonable service with a broken heart for his community. But can I tell you, if you need some help developing some concern, you ought to stop by on a Saturday at 10 a.m., come with myself or Brother Austin, and make some bus visits with us. You go into some of these houses, you approach some of these houses that we minister to, and we have some wonderful families that come off the bus. Please don't misunderstand me. Not everybody that comes off the bus route uh, you know, is, is, in, is in deep and, and horrible sin and things like that. We have wonderful families we've been able to see come in and minister to. But some of them are just, it's bad. I mean, it's bad. You need some concern for our community, just come on out. Do some surveying with me. I was thinking about those nursing homes. I don't have time. I don't have time to get out to the nursing homes anymore, folks. But it would be a blessing if some, some people would say, you know what, I got, I got a half hour on Sunday or Saturday. I could go over there and sing a couple songs with them, give them a 15-minute devotion. Yeah. I could help out the nursing homes. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4 says, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Oh, there's wonderful ministry and tears. Amen. What a re wonderful revival. What a revival that would break out if God's people here at Green Meadow Bible Baptist Church would, would simply just go forth out in our community weeping and bearing precious seed, the seed of God's precious word. 
I know I'm getting on you a little bit today, but I really hope that you'd take the advice. I hope that you'd go out there and you'd survey our area. I hope that you'd realize that if we're going to have any sort of success in this great work, it's going to take some vision. It's going to take some concern with God's people. If we don't reach him, who will? Amen. Amen. God has not commissioned any, any secular organization to reach this community. Right. Amen. Do you remember, you remember in our country back in the day when the local church actually cared for people in the community? Now all these programs, all these government programs, all these, listen, that's, the church has just said, hey, hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Papa government. Amen. We appreciate that. That's not the government's role. That's not their responsibility. And I'm thankful for it. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not dogging anybody that has to deal with any of those things. I'm not dogging. I'm saying that's just not their role. Hey, man, the local churches are supposed to rally around the communities. The local churches are supposed to develop a burden in the area and say, hey, we need to do something. I could keep going. I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm move on here. Point number two, we see in verse number five, we see there's also communication. Hey, listen, concern is, is, is we're desperate for concern if we're going to get the great work done. Amen. But if we're going to get the great work done, it's also going to take communication. Look at verse 5. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He goes on to pray. Oh, the power in prayer that God's people neglect. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He said in Matthew chapter 21, verse 22, In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. He said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, y'all, y'all okay out there? Amen. It's, it's all right. I'm, I'm going to read a couple verses to you. Luke chapter 11, verse 13, if ye, if ye then, this is what Jesus said, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them, that ask him. He said in John chapter 14, verse 13, and, uh, and verse number 14, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. He also said in John chapter 15, verse 7, If, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Isn't that amazing? Great promise. Now I understand. We we understand that there's a correlation there between God's will. We're not we're not we're not uh, the charge here. And if if you went immediately to Lamborghini uh, in this promise for prayer request, your heart's in not in the right place. Amen. But praying for power to reach our community, praying for strength, praying for enabling, praying for opportunities, praying for doors to be open. Those are all within the will of God. And. Praise God, we can pray and we can have a confidence and assurance from Scripture that He'll hear that prayer. He'll answer that prayer. He'll empower us to get out there and get the gospel into our lost and dying community. James, he said, ask for wisdom. He said, ask in faith. Ask with confidence. Ask in faith. He said, he said don't ask amiss. Hey Amen. That's talking about consuming it upon our love. Don't ask it to try to consume something upon the lust. Hey, hey Amen. Listen, John said in, in 1 John, you guys okay? I want to read a little scripture here. Amen. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Whatsoever ye ask, it we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. He, he said in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse uh, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything... According to his will, he heareth us. And if we know, verse 15 says, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Oh, man, this is, and this, can I tell you, that is just found by searching the word ask. There are so many other references in Scripture to prayer and the answers to prayer and the power of prayer. That's just a simple, quick uh, word search of the word ask. Amen? Uh, with, uh, with all of the promises, with all of the examples in the Word of God about prayer, then why aren't we a people of prayer? Hey, listen, if we're going to get the g- great work done, if we're going to have any success in the great work that God has called us to do, it's going to take a burden. It's going to take a broken heart. It's going to take a concern. But it's also going to take communication. 
Hey, we got to call down that power. Hey, man, we got to call down that strength from glory. We need to ask for that wisdom and, and, and seek for God to guide us and direct us and to lead us. Why is it so hard for us to have a consistent and fervent prayer life? Nehemiah knew something about prayer. His broken heart brought him to his knees in prayer. He surveyed and he prayed. And then he prayed for pardon. Look at verse 6 and 7, chapter number 1. It says, he says, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Hey, listen, this request uh, for pardon, it, it goes to uh, all the way down to verse number 10. Uh, but in these verses, Nehemiah, in prayer, in communication, is referring back to the blessing and the curse that I mentioned in the introduction uh, brought before God's people back there in the book of Deuteronomy. He not only acknowledges uh, the 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 cures, uh, curse uh, for rebellion, but the blessing of his mercy in Deuteronomy chapter number four and chapter and and, uh, and chapter number thirty as well. Listen, he knew that if they were going to have any sort of victory, Amen. If they, if any victory uh, it, it was it was going to take recognition and repentance for them to get their great work done, I still believe that Second Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen applies. To us as God's people, by by faith in Christ as Savior, Second Corinthians or Second Second Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen. If my people, are you saved today? You're His people. We didn't replace Israel. Amen. That's a that's 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 a that's a that's a, that's a, that's a heresy. That's a that's a biblical error. We didn't replace Israel. We've been grafted in. Amen. That's biblical. We've been grafted in. That's in the Book of Romans. If my people, you're saved today. You're His people which are called by my name, were Christians, Christ-like, called by his name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know, we have a hard time. I think one of the reasons why we have a hard time in our regular, consistent communication with the one who can help us get the job done the reason we have a problem with our communication is because we don't want to first address the need for pardon. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm a once saved, always saved kind of guy. All my sin was hung on that cross of Calvary. It was all judged in the body of my Savior, Jesus Christ. There's nothing more sinful wise I'll have to answer for for my eternity. But you know what? Sin still impedes a fellowship. Hey, no, the, the relationship is cared for. I'm a son of God, and I'll never not be a son of God. That is settled forever in eternity. But on this, in this world, uh, in this life, uh, there's going to be times where I'm tempted to step outside of the boundaries of God's word. And in so doing, if, especially if that becomes habitual, it impedes that fellowship with a God who can help me get the job done. And the first thing, the first thing we need to address in communication is pardon Nehemiah realized this. Amen. Nehemiah understood this. I was listening to a message by uh, Brother Fugate the other day down there in, uh, in uh, Clay's Mill Baptist Church in, in Lexington, Kentucky. And, and I didn't get to finish the message. I really only got through the introduction and then the mower ran out of gas and then I got ADHD and started a different message by the time I started mowing again. But anyway, he reminded his people there uh, down there in that, that, that church in Kentucky, he reminded how that our country didn't win our independence because of our military might. We were outnumbered. We were outgunned. And in, in, in many, many times we, we lost many, many battles before the war turned. We had lots and lots of casualties. We didn't win our independence because of our military might, but because God intervened on so many occasions. It was by his providence that we are the country we are today. And I understand there's some out there today like to deny his very existence. There's some out there today that would like to separate uh, Christianity uh, from, from our governance. Listen, that's not what the separation of church and state is. You ought to educate yourself on that before you run down that road. 
That was a letter written. That was a letter written uh, by, by the Baptist, amen, in Rhode Island because they were concerned as they started to do what the old country did and they started putting up churches for the states. And they said, wait, 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 wait. We don't want to be the, ba- we don't want to be the church state of Providence or of, of Rhode Island. We want a separation there. We don't want the church to be married to the state. That's all that was. It was was for the protection of the church, not the protection of the state. Our country is to be governed by by the scripture. You look at many of our laws or many of our laws were were were. uh, introduced as a as a something from the Old Testament uh, in, in a way. You think about bankruptcy laws, seven years. That's an Old Testament. That's an Old Testament law, right? Those are all laws of our founding fathers. A lot of those things were established by saying, "Hey, this worked in the Old Testament." Right. Amen. It, it should be able to work over here in this new country. That's not even in my notes. We're just having some fun here. If y'all are okay with that, Amen. hey, we didn't win. Because we are strong, we won because our God is strong. If you're broken about the needs of our communities, if your heart aches because of of what you see our country turning into, then I can promise you our hope is not found in a political party, especially the one that we supposedly aligned with most of the time. You know why I've never called myself a Republican? Because of what we just heard these last couple weeks. They're, they have they have moved in their they have moved in their position to now be they, they, many of them have crossed the aisle and signed the, the are trying to sign into law uh, homosexual marriage that mar- that's God's marriage and I, I am friendly to homosexuals because I want I want I love them and I want to see them get born again but they have no business trying to corrupt the the Bible marriage. And we have a lot of that. I'm not a Republican, amen? I'm a Christian, and I'm conservative. And a lot of times I vote with Republicans, but I, think, I see a time where I won't have to be able to vote for anybody. I'll be writing in Brother Leon for everything. Yeah. Amen? I wrote him in for supervisor last time. He didn't get it, though. You didn't get the call, did you, brother? I wrote you in for supervisor last election. Tell him what I said. You didn't, get the, you didn't get the call, did you? No. I'm going to have to just write you. probably be a day where I have to write you in for everything because I just can't. There ain't nothing I can. There ain't nobody I can vote for. Amen. <laughs> but let me tell you. But let me tell you. Our hope is not found in a political party. It is not found in a candidate. Amen. We have sinned in this country. And we will never have the victory We will never get this great work done until we first acknowledge our sin against God and with a humble and repentant heart, pray for pardon. God, we failed you. Our country has sinned. We have got into gross wickedness. We have turned on you. That goes for the work here at Green Meadow Bible Baptist Church. That goes for the work in your homes. You'll never have the power that you need to to see the great work done in your homes if you're not willing to seek and to search and to examine your lives and to find those things that are contrary to Scripture and say, God, I'm sorry. Get them away from me. We see not only prayed for pardon, but he prayed for providence. Look at verse 11. Oh, Lord. That's in chapter number 1, verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. He knew that his responsibilities before the king would hinder being able to act on the burden and the broken heart that he'd received by his survey, and by his understanding of his people. He was the cupbearer. He had responsibilities in the palace. He knew the king had to sign off on his departure to this great work. As we read on and we see that God did certainly move, amen, he moved and providentially moved in the king's heart. He granted not only permission for Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem, but he also assured some provisions for the great work from the king's hand, amen. Every month on the, 
uh, 21st, I'm reminded of, uh, of uh, my neglect of providential prayer. Proverbs chapter 21, verse number 1, the Bible says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. I know I'm guilty of this. So this proclamation is not from a position of innocence, but a position of humiliation. But it is our Christian responsibility to pray for our president and our governor not to mock them and not to poke fun at them. Listen, it is okay. And I believe it's our American duty to question their policy. But I sure hope that we would pray for them and that we'd be asking for God's providence more than we post about his gaffes and failures. God's prov- God providentially moved with Art Artaxerxes. He moved Nebuchadnezzar. He moved good kings. And he moved wicked kings. Hey, the truth still remains that President Biden is in the White House because God is permitting him to be in the White House. And God can, and God can still move his heart whithersoever he will. There's a lot of wickedness about our president and about that administration. I believe that with all my heart. But he's still breathing, and none of us have the privilege to proclaim reprobate. If he's still breathing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep praying like he could get born again. I've said this so many times, but could you imagine the headlines? President Biden gets born again, starts governing even more conservative than the Republican Party. Can I, listen, is your God big? My God's big. That's how I'm going to pray. That's how we should pray. Now, I'm going to question, the, I'm gonna question the, 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 the silliness of the administration. I'm going to question the, the policies that are garbage and wicked and, and, and awful. I'm going to question those things. That's right, and that's good to do. I, I think that's our American responsibility to, to, to hold our, our leadership uh, to, to what they say. That, that's the right thing to do. But we can do so. We, we've fallen in as Christians. We've fallen into what the rest of the world's doing. Do you know that not all conservatives and Republicans are Christ-honoring, church-going people? Do you know that? There's a lot of wicked people on both sides of the aisle, amen? Christians, we ought to, we ought, we're, we're to be different. I'll probably upset so many people today, I apologize. No, I don't. I'm sorry, not sorry, amen? Listen, I'm convinced that, that not only in the political realm, but at our workplaces, in our churches, listen, I believe that God can move providentially, but we must Protest. We must, we must pray more than we protest. We see not only he, he communicated, he, he communicated, he prayed for, for pardon. He prayed for providence. He prayed for power. Here, look at verse uh, 4 and also in that uh, second part of verse number 9, uh, chapter number 1. Here, oh our God, if we are despised and turned a reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Look at verse number nine, that second part of verse number nine. Now, therefore, oh God, strengthen my hands. I'm sorry, this was chapter uh, six. I don't have the chapter in there. It's in the book of Nehemiah. I want to say it's in six, actually. Not that verse verse nine is definitely in chapter six. Verse four, I think, is back in. I got all. I got. I I, I wrote down verses without the without the the, the first part of the address. Okay, uh, it's there though. Amen. You search the words here, comma, oh our God, uh, semicolon, and you'll find exactly what chapter that's in. But it's a verse four in one of these first six chapters. Amen. I know the chapter uh, six and verse nine. It says, "Now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands." Listen, Nehemiah knew that his strength. And the strength of those that were in that great work with him was limited and had the potential to fail. He prayed for God to intervene. He knew they needed power 
over the enemy. But also, they needed the physical strength, the power to continue this great work. Listen, I know this is not any deep theology. I understand that. But even in its simplicity, how often are we guilty of this neglect? How often are we fighting our battles and working God's great work without praying for his power? How often? The answer is too often. I think the overwhelming majority would have to testify, if forced to be honest, that it is too often, it is too often that we're serving powerless because we're dependent on our own strength, our own power. Every day we need to pray for God's power to work this great work, to witness, to wait on him. We need his power for all those things. He prayed for protection in verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our, this is in chapter 6, verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. Listen, I know this goes along with strength, but it's important that we pray specifically for protection. Amen? Listen, it is expected that we watch. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. Colossians 4, 2, it says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse number 6 says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Listen, we're, we're to watch. We are commanded to watch. We are expected to watch. Uh, we, we are to watch, but our vision is limited. Can I tell you, we have blind spots. I want to pray. Sam was telling me how they're teaching kids now to drive. It's kind of a scary thing. By the way, my son is in driver's training, and he's drove twice. You guys are all still alive, so it must be okay. <clears throat> but he's telling me, so this new teaching thing, do you know that they don't do the 10 and 2 anymore? Yeah. They do this weird shuffle thing at 9 and 3. Come on, man. This looked cooler and seemed a lot smoother. I, 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 don't, I don't understand the whole shuffle thing. But they also do this thing, Brother Marv, when they are cha- getting, in their, getting their mirrors ready, they're to put their face up against the glass, and they move it until they can't see the end of the car anymore. <laughs> Have you ever done that? <laughs> I look, I sit where I'm going to be driving, and I move it, and I try to get the best. That's something to do with trying to limit, it, limit their blind spots. Listen, I want to pray to the God that has no blind spots. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 says, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write these things, saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. Amen. Hey, we serve the Savior that, 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 that there is nothing hidden before him. Amen. We serve the one who can watch when we cannot watch. Amen. The one who does not need sleep when we have to close our eyes uh, and rest. Praise God. That's the God I want to pray for my protection because he sees it all. Nothing has ever caught him off guard. There's never once been a moment where God said, oops. That's the God I want watching my back. I want to pray for protection for my home. I want to pray for protection for all of your homes. I want to pray for our, us as a church and, and the great work that God has called us to be engaged in. If you don't think that the, enemies, the enemy will bother with us, then you better think again because he does not like progress. However, for all the power that Satan may wield, I'm not, I, don't ever, I don't ever testify of that to scare you, to make you worry, to make you concerned today. I just want you to understand that just as much as he's out there, hey, we serve a big God, amen? As much power that he may be able to wield, I'm going to testify that I have access through Jesus my Savior to the throne uh, where the God of all power occupies. Hey, can I remind you today, Satan is just a tool. Uh, he only uh, has his being today because God permits it praise God someday he will be without he will not be able to put up any sort of fight even if he tries but someday he will be bound and he will be cast in that lake of fire and he will forever be in torments for all the wickedness that he has brought upon uh, this this world but I want to pray for protection this communication we need to communicate and pray for prosperity Look at, I got the chapter right now, chapter 5, verse 19. 
It says, think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Hey, Nehemiah, when I say that word prosperity, sometimes we think of something different. We go back to the Lamborghini thing. Listen, Nehemiah's idea of prosperity is a lot different than what our expectation of prosperity would be. He just wanted God to choose good for him. Isn't that a, isn't that a, a blessing to think? He just wanted, he wanted God to choose good for him. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know, that the, the simple thought of that or the, just the, the, the simple, simple truth in that scripture, I, I, we, we, there, it goes bigger than this. But the simple truth is God, as we get closer to him, as we get closer to him, our will begins to line up with his will. It's just it's simply, because our, our, as we get closer to him, it, it becomes our good pleasure, our desire to do his will. Once we start praying for prosperity... After we get closer to him, because our prosperity is lining up what he considers good. Amen? Do you pray for prosperity? Do you pray for spiritual success in your home, I mean, in your community? Do you pray for God to do good? What is prosperity to you? We've got three more points. We're not going to get there today. We're going to have to wrap up tomorrow or next Sunday. Not oh, tomorrow if y'all want to come back. We'll, we'll just do it next Sunday, though. That's okay. Next Sunday, we'll, we'll, we'll come back and we'll finish the last three points. That's the first two points. I told you I had fun with this. I was having myself a time. Nobody was in this church. Everybody was over there, amen. I was shouting, doing cartwheel. No, I wasn't doing that, but you couldn't prove it because I don't have a video in there. I'm so thankful for God's word. I'm so thankful for these just these couple truths that we consider. Hey, we're in a great work. I mean, God's given us a great work here in this community. And if you go around, you'll find very clearly, very quickly, oh, this, this work is probably greater than we imagine. So much that needs to be done. We must have that burden. We must have that concern. We must communicate. We must pray. Would you stand with me? We'll close today. Perfect timing, sis. Appreciate that. We're waiting on you. I've, this, I've been trying to close for 25 minutes. Just kidding. How's God worked in your heart today? I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to get all the way through all these, these last few points. But there's, I mean, there's more to this passage of Scripture. There's more to these first six chapters uh, that, that we need if we're going to get this great work done. But these first two things, we need a concern and we need a communication. Are you burdened? Are you concerned? Maybe a blessing, Brother Austin. If we just had my office was so filled that we had to use your office on Saturday morning this next week, because some people just wanted to go survey the area and realize how, what, what a great work and what a big work we have before us. It'd be a blessing. Are you concerned? Are you communicating? You ought to be. Hey, we got the privilege to pray. I don't know what God spoke to you about today. With eyes closed and heads bowed, I'm going to just give, turn this invitation over to you. Just spend a few moments if God would work on your heart about something as Miss Holly begins to play. What's God worked in your heart about? Are you burdened? I, I didn't talk about salvation very much today, and I think many people in here have a testimony of knowing Jesus is Savior, if not everybody that, uh, that I've looked, looked over. Um, and, and so that certainly could be the case that maybe everybody here has trusted Christ as Savior, and that's a blessing. But if for some reason you're here and you've never <clears throat> put your faith and belief in Jesus as Savior, then I beg you, would you come to an old-fashioned altar and get that settled today? If you're tuning in over the live stream and maybe you're part of that, of that brokenness, you're part of that, uh, uh, those that are bound in our community, and listen, I want to tell you there's freedom for you in Jesus Christ. And every song, every song I... I hear that use the word I was set free in Jesus every time somebody says I've set free in Jesus, I try to correct them if I, if I can gently and I said, no the Bible says made free amen set free means I can go back to it again made free it's a brand new creation brand new creature in Christ there's freedom those in our community don't have to live in the bounds of, that, of, the, of the drugs and the alcohol and the promiscuity. They don't have to live 
like that. There's freedom. There's freedom. You and I, brothers and sisters in Christ, have that freedom. We've been entrusted with that freedom. We've been commissioned to go deliver that freedom. It's going to take a concern. It's going to take a communication.